check out all of the events that are down the hallway once you make it past the the uh, vendors uh, we are having the party tonight it's at nine o'clock all of the details are in your program um, they're on page 14 check the Twitters later uh, for uh, exact info um, beyond that uh, I do have some giveaways anyone need a water bottle ah! Uh, <laughs> so, uh, who in the front row uh, wants some post-its? Great. Moose? <laughs> so, uh, thank you all for being here on time. Uh, we will get going. Uh, your speaker is Jesse Irwin. She is from uh, the One Password folks and is going to tell you all about uh, security. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. I'm short. I had to fix this thing. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, so I'm just warning you I might get trigger happy with this and I might hack back if one comes flying at me. Sorry, I'm not sorry. Um, that being said, the title of my session is Speak Security and Enter, Better Ways to Communicate Security to Non-Technical Users. Um, if you do know me, awesome, come and say hi after this is done. If you don't, you might know my necklace. I'm not sure how clear it is, but it says OPSEC. This necklace gets me in trouble all the time. It's actually bad OPSEC. I would recommend not getting one of your own. People will recognize you everywhere. Um, I work at 1Password. 1Password is my boo. I will tell all of you 10 times to go and get a password manager and use one. It's a really great tool to help take care of your shit online. Um, and that's the end of that for now. I do quite a bit of work in raising awareness of security and privacy issues in education. I have a little hashtag I like to use to yell on Twitter. Um, and quite a few people in this room help contribute to that conversation. So thanks a lot. I feel like I should probably give you a warning about this talk. Um, it's not a technical talk. I'm not going to be dropping like any elite hacks. There's not going to be any like amazing zero days. It's really going to be more about people-centric approaches to technology and security. And quite a bit of it is going to be based on my own experiences of turning pretty much every conversation I've had for the past three and a half years um, into some sort of security education for regular people that I run into um, in San Francisco. So first things first, we're going to start with some story time. I promised in the talk abstract that there would be some Lord of the Rings, so here it is. Um, a while back I had the flu, and I was in bed, and I was doing that like watch every movie on Netflix that ever happened, even the ones you've already seen thing. And I got in, I, I was watching, and there was this scene from Lord of the Rings. Um, it was in the Fellowship of the Ring, and there was this like whole group of dudes. They had a problem to solve. So there were some elves, there were some hobbits, there was a dwarf, I think. He had some attitude. Um, and there was a wizard guy, and everybody was really crazy about like what color hat the wizard was wearing. I don't know anywhere where that happens in the world. Uh, but they all had this really big challenge to solve. And part of it, kind of made me think of a security team because they all had really different uh, skill sets, was just that they had to find this invisible door after making their way through some pretty dangerous territory. And if you paid attention to the movie, like it wasn't just dangerous territory. They had these like really hideous, kind of nasty looking malicious actors. Like those orc things are gross. If you don't believe me, go check Google. They're gross. Um, and once they got through all of that, they were at the base of a mountain looking for a door, and it was this door. We should probably talk about this door. First of all, it was an invisible door, right? So who do we know that builds invisible doors? Anybody? <laughs> um, and the only people who knew how to really find it were the people who knew how to look. So that was kind of a regular thing in Dwarvis ar architecture. and. <sighs> In this case, it, the people looking for the door got lucky. A Little bit of starlight, a little bit of moonlight, and boom, it showed up. Not only did the door show up, there's a password hint right in front of their faces, and it's up there in whatever that language is, you know, 
carved into the side of the mountain. That's a bad password security practice. Please don't put your password hints in the side of a mountain. <laughs> uh, but the door comes up, and the words speak friend and enter show up on, on it. And they start saying friend to the door, but their brute forcing really isn't helping. And neither are the dictionary attacks. They try every single, you know, opportunity that they have to throw the word friend at the door, they use it. Doesn't happen. Doesn't open. They step back a little bit and they start thinking like, okay, we just had a really big red team fail. This is kind of embarrassing. We need to get in here. Well, let's pay attention to the details. One of the details was that even though the door was built by dwarves, the text was in Elvish. So if you keep saying the dwarvish word for friend when everything is written in Elvish, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think the door is going to magically like open if you type in the wrong password? No, probably not. So after stepping back and thinking a little bit, they realized, hey, we're probably speaking the wrong language here. Let's try again. So they use the right word for friend, which I'm not even, we're not going there today. I'm not saying it. But they got through. So by now, you're probably like, what the hell does this have to do with security? Besides the dwarves' inability to document their own doors or back doors, how very juniper of them, uh, besides... <laughs> Yay! <laughs> besides some poor password security practices, and besides some really crappy brute forcing, I mean, beating up a stone door with a wooden stick, yeah, that's not going to work. You have a team basically doing a whole bunch of really great but kind of thankless work to literally save the world that they live in from a whole bunch of malicious crap. And when they hit an obstacle, a really, really hard point, they start throwing a bunch of language out, but they're literally speaking the wrong word to make sense of the situation. And to me, because all I ever do is think about security all the freaking time, this was a great metaphor for security awareness. Because one thing that, as practitioners, we tend to do is we get security words, you know, stuck in our head. We get technical words stuck in our head. And then we go to the regular people that we work with or the regular people that we live with. And we're like, yeah, let me vomit 25 technical words at you and then ask, why don't you understand this? Why is it hard? Why isn't this easier? What's so hard about, you know, knowing the difference between this encryption and that encryption and this here and that there? So, I don't know. Maybe to you it doesn't have anything to do with security, but to me it did. Because when you look at the situation that we're in as an industry, no matter how many defensive tools we use, attackers can still do pretty much whatever they want without having to burn a zero day or without having to even really be any sort of, you know, technically elite to break into um, an enterprise. So all of that being said, um, how do we fix it? So one of the first things that when we are talking security to regular people, we need to realize is we need to step back and figure out, you know, what do they know? What we need to realize most importantly is they probably don't know much about technology at all. Besides the on button, the off button, and the how the hell do I turn this off so my kid doesn't spend $8,000 on iTunes button, there's not a whole lot going on under the surface. And it's not their fault. For the most part, people don't understand technology. And the vast majority of people we work with and the kids that you know we know or that live around us, most people we encounter never had a class that said, hey, so this is an API. This is what it means, and this is how it works. So when we start talking about, well, you hook the API to this, and then you have to make sure that the output is sanitized and that and the other, you lose the person that you are trying to educate and you lose the person that you're trying to communicate with. So the first thing you have to do is realize, like, even if someone knows a little bit of the lingo, they probably don't have an idea of what's going on inside of this silver boxy thing that we've all spent a lot of money investing in. Even worse, one other thing that happens is when it's time to have a conversation about security with colleagues, with kids, with family members, Typically, people want to know, you know, how do I get online? How do I just do this one really quick task? So instead of really understanding the series of steps that you need to take to accomplish something online or to make sure that you're doing the right thing, most people just want, you know, steps one through ten. You know, step one, go to this page and look for this button. Step two, click this button. Step three, once the button is clicked, go put words in and click another button. The problem with that approach 
is for one, especially on the security side, we're not helping our users build a mental model of what they're doing. They get very dependent on following an exact series of steps, and then when the UI changes, or an interaction goes away, we suddenly have a huge security problem because our users are stuck. By now, we should all know that usability is a security problem, and when we make people focus too much on the steps to actually use software, we're doing them a really big disservice because they don't really learn much past look for this arrow and put these five words in. Next, we have a sign bunny here. Um, to explain that content is really key. So when you have a user's attention or you have a coworker's attention, don't throw it away. When we're teaching, it's really important to know that people learn best through personalized content, through storytelling, and through entertainment. Jokes work. Stories work. People might not totally remember every single word of a story, but if you make sure that you're telling a good story about security, and then you really nail that like last punchline, they're probably going to remember that part. They're probably going to carry it with them, and they'll probably even repeat it to other people, which is even more important. Another thing that's really important to think about, too, is one of the most important documents that people get when they're in a workplace, or even students in school, they get handed an acceptable use policy. So these things are full of legalese, really like crazy technical jargon, and for the most part, users think that that's actually an educational document. So your acceptable use policy could have all kinds of crazy password rules in it, but because that use policy at work is the most important thing that they have to guide how they're using technology, they're probably going to carry some of those practices home. So for example, if you have a really bad use policy that says to put $2 signs in the place of S's, that's a password practice someone's going to take home because they think that's good. The same thing for things like iCloud accounts or university login accounts. When a student sees that they're only allowed to have 15 characters and they have to have, you know, five stars, two vowels, you know, 13 ways to describe broken feelings, whatever, they are going to carry that with them into the other sites that they use and the other things that they do online. So maybe instead of just handing over this big, you know, packet of legalese, Try making it fun. We know a lot about what content actually works with people because we have this thing called the internet. And maybe the security team's not the best place to go to create the content. Maybe you need you know, to have friends in marketing or to reach out to other people in your organization who know how to communicate. But the most important thing that you can do content-wise is to make sure that when you're trying to educate and when you're trying to share important lessons about security that are really vital to what you're trying to accomplish, you make it interesting. I mean, all of us hate clickbait, but at the same time, if I have 27 horrible feelings about that password I made last week come across my dash, I'm probably going to click on it and I'm probably going to share it. And I'm probably going to share it with someone who needs to know about that more than I do. The same thing goes for, you know, making videos, finding, you know, security reactions on Tumblr. That's a really great one. But if you make someone laugh or you teach them something that they don't expect to learn, they will remember it longer and the work that we do on the security side will last longer. The third thing to think about when you're trying to teach people about security or talk about security in general is just the examples that you're using. Um, I have a little bone to pick, which you will see on the next slide. Most technical metaphors that we tend to use right now rely on warfare. I'm sorry, I didn't want a picture of people cybering up there. It's just, it was too much. So I got all 18th century on you. Um, and you know, a lot of other metaphors that are out there tend to rely on locks and keys. So. When you step back for a second and think about how the average person works, most people don't really learn about war unless it's in history class or it's on the news or they play a game somewhere. I do almost none of those things. So when people start talking war, to me sometimes it's like, oh, that sounds like a Congress problem. I don't want them touching it. Never mind. Bye. When it comes to locks and keys, those are interesting, and that probably works for the security community because every conference I think I've ever been to has had a lock pick this or you know, an entire track devoted to physical security that's really fun, 
But the average person isn't going to understand, you know, jargon about locks and tumblers and picks and all of these other crazy things that we're really good at doing. So when we sit around and talk about encryption that way, it's like, well, but isn't encryption that scary stuff? Like, I heard about it on CNN the other day. That's that terrorist technology, right? No. And then when you start explaining it through the lock and key metaphors, people are like, oh, no, that is way complicated. Like, if I get locked out of my house, I just call someone else to deal with it. So that's probably not the best set of metaphors you could really be employing when you're trying to get your point across. A better one, and this might seem a little boring, is actually architecture. When it comes to teaching people about security, the first problem that we don't necessarily address is that people don't understand technology. If the average person doesn't have a way of figuring out how technology works, and it's this crazy abstract thing that's kind of hard to get a feel for, the best thing we can start doing is using universal and tangible examples of things that people are very, very familiar with. I don't know about anyone in here, but I've never met anyone who has never been in a house or been inside of a building. So when I start having a conversation about technology, and I'm like, well, wait a second. So let's pretend that this website, let's say Facebook. Facebook is a house, and you have to fit 1.5 billion people in it, and all of their stuff, it has to fit on your walls, and then you have to have private rooms for all of their conversations. Then people step back and they're like, holy crap, how would you fit 1.5 million people in a house? And suddenly, like, the concept of a website and all of the different things that you use to glue all of these technologies together and make them work becomes very real. One of the most important things with architecture, too, is buildings have different purposes. So if Facebook has to hold 1.5 billion people and all of their crap and all of their private conversations and have enough room to stick mom off in some corner somewhere so that she stops liking all of your <laughs> statuses, People are going to understand the difference between a website that's meant to do heavy lifting. If you're like, oh, yeah, that's kind of like a tent. You know, we put it up for like a day or two just to see if this idea would work, you know, to maybe protect us from getting rained on. No big deal. But people will understand, like, different websites have different purposes. Another great thing, too, is from the security standpoint, you can really get into the proactive parts of architecture. So buildings require planning. If you're doing it the right way, you have to have blueprints, you have to have designs, you have to do like math and stuff, which I heard is really hard. So maybe I won't do that, but you have to do all kinds of filing and really like proactive thinking ahead and you have to do planning. Good websites do that stuff too. There's a reason that when people get a bunch of money and they go and build real estate, they're called developers. On the software side, we get a bunch of money, we build technology, and we're called developers too. The only difference is you can see what they're building, and for us, you just tap on a whole bunch of screens and hope the right thing happens at the end. Um, another really interesting thing too, everyone has heard about the three little pigs. They are very well aware of the brick house with standing wind, better than straw or sticks. So if you want to have conversations about choosing secure languages, building a secure foundation, or getting those ideas across, architecture is a pretty good place to spot or to start. Um, one of the best questions I ever had when I was in San Francisco, I went out for dinner one night. It was raining. Um, that's very rare. So rain is important. They haven't let us have it for five years, apparently. Um, but I had someone ask, so how do software vulnerabilities get in there? Like, can't we just get developers to stop making them and putting them in? Yeah, because that's how it works. And I thought about it for a while, because there are a lot of different things that you have to do um, to really get something like a zero day and a piece of software on purpose. And there's a lot of things you actually have to do to get one in there by accident, too. Um, and I realized one really good architectural and building example was just bricklaying. So I'm sitting there, you know, completely drenched next to this little old lady. I, she lives down the street from me. She's like 87. Those damn developers should just stop putting holes in my software. And I explained to her, so they're basically laying bricks when they're putting the code down for the sites that you use. And, you know, maybe one day someone wrote some code and... They put the wrong brick in. 
you know, maybe they weren't measuring the way that the bricks came out, or maybe someone mixed the mortar wrong. And you had no idea that there was some sort of structural flaw, you know, in the bottom corner of that building or that website that you're using, and then one day there's an earthquake, and suddenly there's a giant hole right in the front of the building. She looks at me, she's like, okay, that's plausible, which is pretty good for this old lady. And that's actually a really solid way to convey the concept of, well, if there's a zero day, you have an unknown flaw, and you have to have an event that really brings to life that it happened and it exists for you. So if you're having issues like explaining what that is and how it works and how vulnerabilities get into things, architecture is a really good place to go. Another example I really like to use um, is actually the weather. First of all, if you use something as mundane as the weather, it's not really scary. It's not really off-putting. Everyone has had the experience of having to defend themselves from the elements. Um, how many of us last night were suddenly going for whatever we could find to cover our heads from the rain? So having to actively defend yourself from wind, rain, sun, etc., these are not new concepts. Everyone's done it. We all wear clothes. I hope we all wear clothes. Do we all regularly wear clothes? <laughs> but it's really important if you're trying to get the concept of defense to people to say, like, well, these are times that you also are defending yourself from things that aren't code and, you know, aren't silly things out in the world. If it's hot outside, you get a choice of what you're going to wear. You get a choice of putting on sunblock. If you're hanging out on the web and you're going shopping and there's a whole bunch of ads everywhere, you know, Go put on your HTTPS everywhere or your ad blocker. Those are your rain boots, basically. And go splash around the web and have some fun. If you build that kind of model into how people think about the web, you are much more likely to get better results because it is like something people already do in their regular life. And maybe everyone doesn't wear rain boots. You know, maybe they grab an umbrella. Maybe they grab a coat. Maybe, you know, somebody likes to run out of the house in a really giant fur. But people understand the concept of having to defend themselves from the elements, and there's lots of elements that we have no control over on the web that we have to think about defending people from as well. The other thing, too, is if you forget to put on a raincoat, or you forget to open an umbrella, or you don't have the right defensive tools, there's always something that you can do to still protect yourself. You know, I didn't bring my umbrella on this trip, but I could grab a program, I could grab my coat and stick it over the top of my head. I had other options besides just sitting there and getting totally rained on. I could also borrow someone else's umbrella if I needed to and it was an emergency. Another thing to think about when we're talking to people who don't understand technology, this is a scary picture, sorry I'm not sorry, um, is just choosing how we frame the issues that we have at hand. So we have a great power when it comes to influencing the people that we work with and the people who are around us. More often than not, the average person tends to feel really overwhelmed about being online and they feel really hopeless because from one source they get one set of advice and rules and then from another source, you know, there's something that just completely conflicts with what they've heard from someone they might trust. A good example of this, um, I see this every day, but if you look at some of the coverage on password managers and security, a lot of times there will be like one teeny tiny thing that's not really high in criticality, and it's a story somewhere, and suddenly every security practitioner on Twitter says, oh no, password managers are a nightmare. No, that's not fair. Another thing that we're starting to see is, well, VPNs don't work. Okay, that one might be legit. Antivirus sucks. Okay, sure, why not? Trust nothing. Okay, that might work for some people. But if I'm an end user, you've just taken away all the things that I thought were tools that I had in my arsenal, and now what the hell am I supposed to do? More often than not, people say, okay, I don't know what to do, I'm just not gonna do anything. Like, I'm gonna make my password, I'm gonna change it every 90 days so that whoever's in charge of Active Directory doesn't come in and kill me, and that's it. I'm not having anything else to do with this security mess. Being too negative and being too focused on some of the risks that do come with using software, especially the ones that don't fit a user's threat model, 
really does nothing to bring more people onto our team. It's bad for our users. An example I can think of that's really near and dear to my heart, um, once upon a time, I got trapped in a room of eight-year-olds, which, if you have no children, is kind of a nightmare because eight-year-olds are a little intimidating. But um, my friend you know, had to run out of the room and was like, just teach them something about the internet. You can figure it out. So I decided I was going to teach eight-year-olds about encryption. Now, these are eight-year-olds. This was actually amazing. I walk in, I'm like, all right, kids, let's talk about the internet today. I'm going to tell you about a superhero. Because eight-year-olds like, like superheroes. The superhero is called encryption, and it's math that people tried to make illegal. Eight-year-olds are like, oh my god, you can make math illegal? I am never doing homework again. This is the best <laughs> thing that happened. So they're all like hyped up about this encryption thing, and they're like, OK, so what is it? I go right a word on the board. I was like, you see this? It's right here in the clear. They're like, yeah, what about it? OK, kids, OK. So I start to draw little numbers around it. And I'm like, you see these little numbers? That's encryption. It's like an invisibility cloak. Now, one of my rules for adults is to never explain technology in terms of magic. But when it's eight-year-olds and you are fearing for your life, you better use that magic. <laughs> so. The kids are like, okay, so like, how do I know that the superhero is there? So I go to the browser bar, and I go, you see this green lock up here? If it's green, that means the superhero's got you covered. The kids are like, yeah, so what does the superhero do again? I'm like, okay, put a word in. Put in the worst word you can think of. Homework was the worst word of the day. <laughs> so they hit submit. I was like, well, your friend up there, that superhero, just took your homework word that you thought was ugly, hid it from anybody else who might be trying to look at what you're saying, and made sure they couldn't see it. Now, the kids were like, no way. No, that's not possible. I was like, wait a second, wait a second. We should talk about this. So if you're wearing an invisibility cloak, what can go wrong? This is where the eight-year-olds are freaking brilliant. One kid goes, all right, so you can see when someone puts it on, and then you can see when someone takes it off. The kid just explained metadata to me, and he's like eight. So I was like, all right, cool, you win, I'm done. Another kid was like, well, you could step on it when you're walking across the room and you're trying to hide from people. OK, that's legit. I think that there's some sort of technical equivalent to that somewhere. My favorite kid was like, you could put it on wrong. It's true, if you're trying to PGP encrypt something in a hurry, you could totally put the PGP on wrong. But the kid says, and then your butt will be sticking out on the internet. <laughs> so, the kids got encryption. I was so excited about this, like not only did I get the concept of secure browsing across to them in their own language and in their own words, I was like, yes, I win. These kids were like, all right, so what other thing do I look for? What if the lock's not there? Well, look for the S. These are eight-year-olds. Their threat model is literally themselves most of the time, if not the kids sitting next to them. So telling them to look for the lock and telling them to look for the S actually works. What I didn't realize would happen is that this class of eight-year-olds, every time they went on the internet for the next three months, would point out to their teacher, <clears throat> there's no S here. <laughs> Miss Stewart, there's no S here. How do we get an S here? <laughs> sorry, I'm not sorry. <laughs> so what ended up happening is those kids um, and their teachers, who teachers totally got the whole invisibility cloak thing, by the way. Apparently, this movie Harry Potter was a big deal. Don't know if you've heard of it. But they realized that they could start using HTTPS everywhere which comes from the Electronic Frontier Foundation and basically forces SSL when you're connecting to a site if it's available. So these kids looking for their superhero, looking you know, for that green padlock, looking for the S, were so adamant about making sure they had this S that they made their entire school adopt HTTPS everywhere. Wow. So that's... <laughs> So that was a pretty fun day, and that was a pretty fun story, and a pretty fun experience. 
And then I came back to some friends in security, and they were like, well, you shouldn't talk about it that way. What about padding attacks? You should talk about padding attacks. They should know about that. <laughs> They're eight. Exactly. Their threat model is themselves. And it got me thinking, though. So like, I had this cool experience where I knew exactly how to talk about this thing important to me to a group of eight-year-olds who are going to bug everyone they know about it until, you know, I don't know, the end of their lives, I hope. But when I went back to my own community and started having conversations about it, it was suddenly a problem and not cool. And the reason that that happened, I have thought about for a long time, but it was this. As practitioners, we really want to be transparent and we really want to be open with the people we are trying to educate, but sometimes we do it to a fault. It's okay if we are teaching people stuff, like I didn't teach about padding attacks because I didn't really have to. But it's okay when we are trying to get people excited about what we're doing, if we use a little teeny bit of artistic license and we get them onto our side. It's not okay if we're trying to get people excited about security and then suddenly we tell them everything that's wrong with all of the steps that we're teaching and all of the tools that we're trying to bring into an organization or into our own homes. It's not good to say, okay, well, we're gonna do this new security thing. None of it's gonna work. Who gets excited about security when you put it like that? So at the end of the day, when it comes to how we teach people, how we talk about things, and how we frame them, we have a lot of choices, and we have a lot of influence, and we have a lot of sway. I picked the last judgment scene here because one side's hell, one side looks pretty happy and heavenly. We kind of sit in the middle between the technical people and the non-technical people, and we do quite a bit that influences whether someone's experience learning about or trying to implement security measures is going to be hard or whether it's going to be easy for them and kind of fun. So I'm pretty sure there's someone out there still thinking this, but, but security awareness, it doesn't work. Yes, it does. People do dumb stuff. We're not going to change that. People don't always use common sense. We're probably not going to change that either. We're not going to be able to fix it. But when we sit around and we talk about how dumb people are, and we speak poorly of our end users, we're not really taking any initiative to fix the problems that we have at hand. That's a huge problem because it doesn't make us smarter, and it doesn't make them smarter either. If the one thing that we do know is we come up with policies, and we come up with all kinds of user interfaces, and our users still aren't going to have an idea of what is going on, we can build things to fail safe, instead of fail our users all the time. So maybe instead of side swiping and being dirty about, oh, those idiots, I hate them. They're going to completely ruin my policy. No, that's not the right thing to do here. Uh, when it comes to security awareness and education, there are things that require investment. They don't scale really easily. It's going to take time. It's going to take patience. And if you look at the metrics, they're probably going to be really similar to what goes on in public health education. You know, after decades of health campaigns about heart disease and smoking, people still die of heart disease and lung cancer and all kinds of other preventable illnesses. But we don't stop teaching people about how that works. And while we might not be able to change everyone's behavior, we can if we're really persistent and we're patient, which is hard to do sometimes, I completely understand. Um, we, can, we can swing people over to our team with a little bit of persistence and just by building bridges with people in our organizations who are non-technical and who do come from other disciplines that have the skills that'll help us drive the message that we need to the people who need it the most. Typically, focusing on outcomes and people is much more productive than just focusing on the technology and the technology words. But when you look at what's happening in our industry, in our organization, and even just in regular plain old technology, Everyone's trying to solve problems with code that are not problems that can be solved with code. The stuff that we need to do on the security side is not stuff that you can go and build an API for. It's not stuff that you can go and build a quick web app and ta-da, nobody gets fished anymore. Wouldn't that be so much fun? That's not how it goes. The stuff that we need to start doing is paying attention to the people that we work with. We need to think about how to educate them 
how to communicate to them, and how to make them care about the stuff we're doing. As security people, we already know that everything that we do on so many different levels is vital for how our world works. We need to start making it make sense to other people, and we need to do it in ways that are not scary, that aren't off-putting, and that don't make people run in the other direction with their hair on fire. If we keep doing what we are currently doing, it's not only the definition of insanity, but it's just not going to help us. If you look at what's going on in terms of legislation, there are so many conversations all over the world where people either want to regulate what's going on with security research, they want to take away my boo, which is encryption. By the way, if you call your password manager your boo, people are like, what? What is that thing? I want a boo, how do I get one? So, pro tip, use strange words to describe friendship with software. People will be very curious, and they will also want that particular relationship. But that being said, there's so many people out there on the planet who don't get what we do. We're like a whole bunch of wizards who are doing all this magic, scary stuff that doesn't make sense, and they don't want any part of it, and they're so scared of it, they would rather just go on a big witch hunt and come after us with pitchforks and torches instead of hear what we have to say. So if we do our own part to be our best ambassadors and to really start talking about all of this scary, weird, hard, security is hard. I don't know if y'all have been paying attention. But if we do everything we can to make this easier and to make the average person care about it, we will have better outcomes. One thing that would be really great um, if anyone has time to go read another book just applying something like the growth mindset to security, instead of saying that things are good or bad and putting judgment on them, step back for a second and say, okay, we can learn anything if we work hard enough. We can get other people to be good at anything if we encourage them to work hard enough at it. If you put in enough hours, if you put in enough time to build fluency and to really get good at whatever you're interested in or something like security that you care about, you can inspire others to do the same. And maybe we won't have like six billion people trying to figure out how to shell this and drop an O-Day on that, but if it's enough to get people to stop using the same password on every single website that ever existed on the whole planet, that gets us somewhere. At the end of the day, if we're gonna keep this web thing that we love, we need both sides working together. We need the technologists, and we need the users working together. So if we can, let's try to find the right language for our end users and to speak security with them and not to them in a condescending way. Questions? The question was whether I've done any gamification with security awareness and training. Personally, I haven't. Um, I've seen a lot of people try, and I've, I've looked over some of their attempts to do so. But the one time that I was involved, everyone got really stuck in the metrics. Like, it didn't, the content kind of got lost when people were trying to figure out, well, how do we have a 20% month over month improvement to get, you know, the budget for this? So. I've seen it sort of work, but I haven't personally done it myself. You work a lot with educators, and we talked about teaching security to educators. Have you seen any progress in having educators help us teach better? The question was whether I've seen any progress with having educators help us teach. So I've done a lot of work with educators, and just getting them to realize, like, this is the security 101 stuff you don't know is enough of a challenge. They get excited about it. They see why it's important. But typically, educators focus on getting kids to create content and to do stuff online that they can grade. You know, something like 97% of people think that um, security should be taught in schools with technology. And some people argue that it is in digital literacy curriculum. But they just don't have the funding. And you can see all the time, schools will go on Twitter and they will crowdsource you know, bringing in an author that the kids love or an expert on science or something like that from Twitter 
when it comes to security, there's not one person in your average school or in your average school system who has that responsibility. So there's no place for that uh, subject matter expertise to go from a technology coordinator to a teacher. Um, in the back. Yeah, the comment was kids like to go to HTTPS. Kids know about that onion thing. I don't know if y'all have heard about it. It's called Tor. It's kind of a big deal. Kids know what that is, and they will get through their little content blocking system in five seconds when they figure out what's happening with it. Yeah, so the question was whether it was a conscious choice to, um, to use examples that don't have necessarily an adversarial component. Definitely, um, when people you know, get on the internet and the first thing they think is, oh shit, I'm under attack and all I did was you know, type in Google, that is just not a good feeling. So for me, when I choose examples, I go for you know, common, mundane, not scary things. And I try to make sure that overall, like, I'm not going to be overwhelming someone. I want the average person, even though we have all kinds of crazy APT crap going on, I want regular people to feel some sense of agency when they are using the web and to feel like they have control, even if the control is only, I use secure browsing practices and a password manager. You know, from our perspective on the security side, we can say, well, it doesn't matter if you use a password manager because your router could have malware. That's true, but I still want my end user doing the secure stuff anyway, even if there's some other upstream attack. Yes. Thank you. The comment was, thanks for not scaring people out of using the internet. Did you have questions over here? I haven't looked over here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's really awesome. People love infographics. For everyone who's on the live stream, um, she was just telling us that she had pitched the idea of doing something for Cybersecurity Awareness Month um, at her law firm to their CIO, and they went for it. So yay, infographics. Those actually help, believe it or not. In the back? Um, so the question was if I had any repositories I could share. I know there's some out there. I can ask my friends on Twitter, and it seems like someone over here has some suggestions. Um, I don't have any at hand. I usually just keep a list somewhere in my phone or in a notebook or something and see if they stick when I try them on people.
all the way in the back over here. Anyone else? Can you repeat what she just said? I oh, I kind of heard her say that there was a repository in the UK, but I didn't catch the URL. So, uh, the Analogies Project. <laughs> Yay for loud people! <laughs> there was someone over here that I missed. Yeah, so the question was, um, how do you teach younger kids to look for some sign that what they're using is secure when we're moving to a more app-based environment? That's a great question. Um, for the most part, when it comes to apps, like we can all complain about them being walled gardens unless you know how to plug that thing in and look for what calls it's making and whether they're encrypted, there's really no good way. This is a huge problem um, in education technology. There are a lot of conversations going on right now about not spying on kids, except when you look at some of the apps that are used in classrooms, you have mobile analytics kits, and you can get personal information about someone's usage patterns from those kits, and that's a huge problem. So if that's an area that you are interested in or you know people interested in it, by all means, please pick up and do some research because that is an area where if there's no S and no lock to look for and it's literally just download this app and trust me, that gets us in a lot of trouble um, when it comes to Android apps and everything's sort of moving in that direction. Anyone else? We have a few more minutes. Oh, I see over here. Cheryl! <laughs> Sorry. Wait, which part did I say that in? My brain is mush. <laughs> She's asking me to outline, I think, the differences between training, user education, and getting buy-in. I think I probably said something along the lines of training tends to be you know, focused on a big set of rules, where education is something that doesn't necessarily happen from use policies and other things. It's something that happens when you, know, you amuse someone or you educate them. And getting the buy-in is just being more positive with users and making sure that you frame things in an exciting and a fun way. Does that hit it? I see one more in the back. Sure. So the question was if there's any data behind um, my judgment call to not really talk about the adversarial nature of security. There isn't. And when I sort of, when I start explaining security in some of these terms, like I always make sure within the first 45 seconds, I bring up now what can go wrong? Because it's the what can go wrong part that, you know, people say, well, some jerk can break into my house. That's a big deal. Um, but I don't really have data to back it up. So. Um, anyone else? I maybe have time for one more, and then I have to get off the stage because the next talk's coming in. Yes. Uh, 
the question was if there were resources for parents to get involved at the school level. Um, there's not really, because every school system works differently, every state department of education works differently, and they all get their federal money differently. There's not one unified way to do it. The best way is to realize that the most impact you will have will take place at the local level. So if you go to your PTO meeting or your PTA meeting and you raise a fit, if you go to your school board meeting and you ask them, who's defending my kid's network? What are you doing to make sure that my kid's data is not getting dumped and sold by the lizard squad? P.S. That still happens. Um, ask those questions at the local level and you will get answers because if you go any higher than that, there's so many levels of bureaucracy, just nothing good happens. Thank you all very much for coming. I hope you learned something. And go have too much fun schmooing. <laughs>